had this break, we used to call it just a breakthrough, just a move of the Holy Ghost. And people are getting prayed for and the body is ministering and that's what we're supposed to have. What good is church if you just come and throw a few bucks in and you sing a song and then you hear a sermon and you go home unchanged? Doesn't mean that we're lost. You can be very, very saved and still need change. Amen. 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 Why don't you make your way back to your seats for just a moment? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wonderful. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We're not trying to stop anybody from seeking the Lord. Praise God. I want to tell you something. It takes courage to get up and seek the Lord. Say what you want to. I preached you a sermon a few weeks ago. I, 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 I think I'm going to preach that again sometime. That conviction's not enough. We think if we can just create conviction and God will give conviction, it'll work. Conviction without being convinced don't work. There's hundreds of people that get convicted in services all the time and just walk out under conviction and nothing happens. Conviction needs to propel us to confessing, to cleansing to change, to alteration. Amen. Ushers, would you be so kind as to, to come? We're going to receive our offering this morning, our tithing. We only have one service today, and uh, that's unusual for us. We're like church people. We, we go to church more than anybody does. But we, this is our friend day, and we invite folks, and they're having a big shindig in the back. We're going to feed everybody's face and uh, maybe even fill a few stomachs if we could. And... Uh, so after the, after the altar service or whatever we're going to do, then we'll go over the back and we'll have a big feast and you're all welcome to, to eat and uh, just enjoy the, the kingdom of God. This is our family. I don't want to hurt you folks. The government is not our family. Corporations, they're not our family. Various enterprises, they're not our family. The church is our family. I thank you, Eric. I got one amen, and Frank waved his hand. I got two. That's great. Amen. Now, now, now hear what I just said. The church is our family. If you have a family, don't lie to me and say, it always goes smooth. The kids always do what they're told. The wife always complies. The husband keeps his foot out of his mouth. That doesn't happen. When you have a family, you have bumps in the road. Some are doing well, some are doing poorly. But you don't love the folks who are doing poorly less than you love the folks who are doing well. And you don't, you don't give up on them, you work with them. And you try to love them and you try to help them, amen? There's one thing the family doesn't need is any more judges. We don't need any more judges. We got a judge. Jesus told us that when you judge, judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. Amen. And mercy rejoices against judgment. Amen. Amen. We're so happy all of you are here today. I ask the Lord to bless the gifts and the givers, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Please don't take anything out.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Clap your hands unto the Lord one more time. Amen. We are coming to the most important part of the service, which is the word of the Lord. How many are ready for the word of the Lord? How many are ready to hear what God has to say? Amen. Again, we welcome, you may be seated. If this is your first time at the Pentecostals of Gainesville, would you stand up or raise your hand? We want to give you a big welcome. First time visitors and guests. Come on, let's. Big welcome. Amen. 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 I want to share something with you. After the preaching, after the preaching, the most important place that we need to come is to the altar. Amen. That's where God changes lives, heals marriages, and transforms anything. Because with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Then after we pray, amen, we are going to bless the food and we are going to have everybody that is over 75 first, okay? And then we're going to line up this way. The first door to your left is the prayer room. We're going to start doing a line. And then in the 120 room here, that's where you're going to get your natural food, amen? We got food for everybody, all right? We got... Five bread, five pieces of bread and two fishes. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we are going to have 12 bas baskets left over. Amen. We got food for everyone. We just need you to be patient. Then in the back, we're going to have tables inside and outside. We got a bounce house with basketball, all kinds of things going on. A cakewalk. Everybody say hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But remember... The 75 and older folks are going to be first, then mothers and, 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 and ladies and, and, and families that have kids. We would like for you to get your kid and give them a plate, amen? No takeout food, amen? Hallelujah. No to-go place. This is not Burger King, but we're going to have, we're going to have dinner with the king, amen? Well, word from the Lord. I heard uh, one of our brothers that had been praying and fasting told me, Brother Martinez, I feel this from the Holy Ghost. He said, if people will come to the altar, God will heal their hearts. Amen. Let's welcome Pastor Arnold as he introduces our speaker for today. Well, praise God. The gentleman we're bringing to the pulpit is no stranger to our assembly. He's been here numbers of times. He's always burned the barn down. Every time he comes, we have to repaint the sanctuary because all the paint is gone. Brother Tisdale is just the prince of preachers. Sister Tisdale, would you stand up? He brought his bride with us this time. Praise God. Glad you're here. Amen. Amen. And we got, we got two of their little children that in Texas, they're called criminals, but they're children here. Come on, little girl, stand up. We want to tell you how happy we are to have you. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Thank you for coming. You're special to us. I'm, I'm as serious as a heart attack. You ain't got nothing I need. You ain't got nothing I want. We got something you need. And, and we got something you ought to want. All we're trying to do is get ready to go to heaven. That's all we're trying to do. Amen. Amen. So we only got one service, so we ought to make it easy for Brother Tisdale to preach. He shouldn't, he shouldn't have to preach his normal hour and 45 minutes. We ought to just get it done in 20 minutes. Why don't you stand one more time? Put your hands together, Brother Robert Tisdale. Now, why don't you applaud Jesus Christ? Would you do that? Go ahead. Clap your hands because... You're in love with Jesus. Would you do it? Clap your hands like you mean it. Hallelujah. Nobody like you, Jesus. Nobody like you. It's an honor to be back in Gainesville. I always enjoy my time here. There is only one Pastor Jeff Arnold. 
and I always thoroughly enjoy my time. My wife and my children had never had the occasion to be with Pastor Arnold. And it's quite a rarity during the school year that my family is with me, to be honest. I travel every single weekend. I fly somewhere in the world. And the last five years, I've spoke over 300 times each year. So uh, he said, I do well. I ought to do well. I get so much practice. And, uh, but there are places you just enjoy being. And there are pastors you just enjoy being with. And Gainesville is one of those places. And so I'm delighted to be here. I'd like my wife to come. I'd like her to greet the audience. Uh, come on, Deborah. And my daughter typically sings, and I told her she wasn't singing today. She would sing every time I would let her, but not today. And uh, here's my wife, Deborah Tisdale, and she is the best part of me. It's a delight to be here. And with him saying, this is my first time in Gainesville, what a beautiful place y'all live. And I've noticed that from the place I grew up in California, that Gainesville's different than California. And the place that I live now in Texas, that Gainesville's different than Texas and California's different than Texas. But you know what I do know? Even though places are different, people are different everywhere you go. And in a few days, we'll be changing hands in the White House, and we're going to have different leadership. One thing I know, God never changes. And I'm so thankful that in the times that things are changing, laws are changing, things are unstable, that God is so constant he is so constant. He's so faithful. He sticketh closer than a brother. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He's not going to change. God is still the same. It's a delight to be here. Bless you all. Say these words with me. Say these two words. Say, never stranded. Touch your neighbor and say, you're never stranded. You may be seated. Today, on this Friends Day, I've come to speak a word of hope to this congregation. To remind you of God's promises. To prompt you to remember the pattern of God's actions in your past. I plan to speak boldness until you're stirred. To align your desires with God's purpose until the promises of God are woven into the fabric of your faith God has sent me with a word for someone's spirit and today I believe when the word is finished miracles are going to occur you see every time God presents a significant opportunity it is always formed in the crucible of crisis it is connected to danger and it will come at a great cost tragedy is often the fertile soil of the miraculous is there a single word a single miracle in the entire word that does not involve affliction barren wombs lead to miraculous births Joseph is sold into slavery the result is one of the greatest examples of forgiveness in human history. The cruel bondage of Egypt culminates with the miracles of the Exodus and the Promised Land. And Jesus' gruesome death leads to resurrection. So rehearse this reality. God's capacity will always exceed your audacity. You never have to worry about putting God in an awkward position or an embarrassing environment. You will never back God into a corner. You will never challenge God to do something beyond His capabilities. There is never going to be a moment when the audacity of our faith exceeds the capability of our God to respond. So pray big prayers. 
dream big dreams. Ask God to do the unlikely, the unusual. Push the envelope of your faith. Isaiah 43 and 13 declares it this way. Yea, before the day was, I am. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work who will let it. The scribe came in Mark 12 and 28. And the scribe, after hearing their conversations of wisdom and reason, he asked Jesus a very pertinent question for us even today. Which is the first commandment of all? Which is the most important commandment? Now, if we spend very long in an organization, it doesn't take much time to determine what their focus is. What is the focus of the kingdom of God? Jesus declared it this way. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. God is one. That is the foundation of everything you could ever learn about your Lord. The oneness of God means that there is no subdivision or composite nature or aspect to His being. God is whatever He is in the purest way possible. God is one. God is pure. He is one in His essence. There is no characteristic that can apply to God in a partial or a limited way. That's what God is one means. In other words, God is like a flawless diamond. When people say a gem is without flaws, they mean it contains no cracks, no grain of a different material, no combination of colors. It is one thing only. Hear me clearly. God is what He is absolutely. He is divine oneness. There is no pantheon of other gods. There are no other gods capable of adding something to your God or taking something away from your God. God is beyond the power of any force in the universe. Simply put, God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. So if God is pure, perfect oneness, if nothing can be added to or taken away, then God is unchanging. You see, change requires a combination of at least two things. A cause and an effect. And the word explicitly leaves no room for a cause or a force that is powerful enough uh, to change God from without. He said it of himself. He said, I am God. And beside me there is none other. I am God, and beside me there is none else. For I declare the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. God is perfectly pure oneness. So not only is there no combination of things from without, there is no combination of things from within. Nothing that could cause a change. God does not rust. God does not age. God does not tire. God does not sleep. God does not slumber. God does not awaken. God is never stressed. He is never overwhelmed. He is never surprised. There is nothing outside of him that can influence change. Nothing that can control him. And there is nothing inside of him that decays, that molds. God is perfectly pure one. So the Lord's changelessness means that God does not grow or learn. And that is in direct opposition to modern theologians that have this vogue idea that God is evolving. For growth and learning would require the addition of new information to God's mind or essence. And God does.
does not change. Such an addition of information would mean God was changing and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He knows everything I face, everything my tomorrow was capable of bringing, and factors in all of my past. God exists throughout the entire universe simultaneously. The only alternative is that God is present in one place and God is not present in others. And if that were true, then God would be here. And he wouldn't be there. And his state of being would be different in each place. In other words, God would change relative to the relationship of space as you and I do. But God is the same. In Rio de Janeiro, in Bogota, Colombia, in Stalingrad, or right here in Gainesville, Florida. God is the same no matter where you and I are. There is no change in God. He is present Everywhere. How does he inhabit you and I simultaneously and yet fill all space? How does he occupy the past, the present, and the future? How does he fill my today and fill my tomorrow? How does he fall in the church in Gainesville and the church in Alexandria? I can't figure it out. I can't tell you how. But I know this. God is present everywhere. So think about it for a moment. Pure, all-powerful, unchanging, all-knowing, ever-present. That's your God. Pure, all-powerful, unchanging, all-knowing, ever-present. One more time. Pure. It would do your faith wonders if you could stand on the reality of God's perfect oneness. Pure, all-powerful, unchanging, all-knowing, ever-present. God is flawless. You see, God is the ultimate example of every characteristic that reveals his nature. God is the ultimate example of every characteristic that reveals his nature. In other words, if the Lord is good, he is perfectly good. If the Lord is holy, he is perfectly holy. If the Lord is consistent, he is perfectly consistent. If the Lord is righteous, he is perfectly righteous. If he is just, he is perfectly just. If he is strong, he is perfectly strong with no weakness within him. If he is great, he is perfectly great without any negative qualities. Otherwise, God would be a composite creature as I am and you are. Part good, part bad. Sometimes fair, sometimes unfair. But God is the perfect example of the attributes that describe Him. He's perfectly good. He's always good. No wonder the psalmist said, If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I ascend into the heavens, thou art there. Whither can I go from your presence? The oneness of God means more than God is not part uh, of a multifaceted deity. The oneness of God means uh, he is not a call, a consolidation of things uh, and he must therefore be fully and completely whatever he is. People like to question him. If God's so good, why does evil happen? If God's so good, why does trouble come? If God is so good, why does he stop mass murder and genocide? Why does Hitler and Pol Pot and Mao live? Why? You see, God is judgment. And if God is judgment, he is perfect judgment. That means not only does he judge Hitler and his evil anger, but he judges you when you cheat on your taxes. He judges you when you tell a lie. He judges you when you're angry. So God said, it's not a day of judgment. I am judgment, but I suspend my judgment. And you are in a day of mercy and grace. 
Because if God ever judges sin, God judges all sin. And he did that already. And only one man found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God says from now on out, I will suspend my judgment until the day of my visitation. That's why if God is judgment, he's perfect judgment. So the freedom that evil has to choose evil is the same free will that I bask in to choose good. That's why it's imperative you choose Jesus Christ in a day of confusing morals, in a day of conflicting ideals. You got to stand up and say, my choice is Jesus. This one ever powerful, ever present, omniscient, omnipotent, holy, righteous God. I wonder, is there anyone on Friends Day who says Jesus is my choice? So in short, Jesus says the Shema or Deuteronomy 6 and 4, God is one. And you say, but why does that matter to me? Why is that important to me? God's perfect oneness means you and I don't suffer from the plurality of a cadre of God's. As did the Mesopotamians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Hindu. I'm not subject to the petty whims of a jealousy or a cruel competing deity. You see, if God is one in flawlessness, he is one in his essence and in his action. And you know what that means? If God is pure, if God is holy, if he's perfect judgment, perfect righteousness, then God never engages in halfway measures. God never saves me and abandons me. He never heals me and leaves me. He never blesses me and forgets me. Because he will not be fair today and unfair tomorrow. Oh, he will not be just today and unjust tomorrow. God will not bless your marriage today and forget your marriage next week. God will not multiply your money and then not multiply your money in another chaotic situation. Because God doesn't change. So in this world of confusion, when we feel like these desperate sailors trying to grasp disappearing waves, you hear me clearly. You can count on God to be completely and consistently what he is forevermore. That fills me with a shout. That tells me if God's faithful, he's forever faithful. That tells me if he is filled with grace, he is grace to me every day. That tells me if he's a merciful God, he'll always be merciful. A forgiving God, he'll forgive me. So when the enemy tries to condemn me, I stand on the word of God. I step back and say, neither. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. That's why you got to refuse the input of your emotions, the negativity that undermines your spirit. God is flawless. God is perfect. If God's blessed you before, he'll bless you again. If God's healed you before, he'll heal you again. We stand on the reality of his consistency. 2 Timothy 2 and 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, for he cannot violate, he cannot deny himself. God cannot violate the reality of his own consistency. God cannot be anything but God. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 24, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. I want someone to hear me in this room. You're not stranded. You're not forgotten. You're not alone. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3 and 3, let me go on. But the Lord is faithful. Who shall establish you and keep you from all evil? I want someone's faith to expand today. God is the place of the universe. The universe is not his place. Did you hear me? God is the place of the universe. The universe is not God's place. Our God spoke with mere words the universe into existence. And then according to Isaiah 40 and 12, he stooped down and measured it with the span of his hand. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven 
with its span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains on a scale and the hills in a balance. That's your God. Who have directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor taught him? Who has taught the Lord with him? Who did he take counsel and who instructed him? and taught him the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are but a drop in a bucket, and they are counted as small dust of the balance. That's why I'm not afraid. God doesn't take his cue from the problems in your life. God doesn't react to the ever-changing vicissitudes in this nation. But God is in complete and sublime control of every facet and every detail of your life. (laughs) Psalm 74 and verse 16. The day is thine. The night is also thine. Say it right now. Look at your neighbor. Say, he's the Lord of the night. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. You have made the summer and the winter. Do you know scientists have discovered stars that are as large in circumference as the entire orbit of Jupiter? Yet God never spent one single ounce of energy creating them. He simply said, let there be. Six words. Six words encompass everything that mystifies us. And he made the stars also. With words, he leveled Jericho's walls. He walked among flesh. He opened blinded eyes. He raised the dead. He walked on the water. And not only did he walk on the water, he enabled an ordinary human being to walk on the water with him. The God you worship can do whatever he pleases anytime he wants. And what pleases God in our generation is to show his glory and renown amongst humanity. So why don't you give God the opportunity to be great? Why don't you dream a God-worthy dream? Why don't you pray a God-sized prayer? Why don't we let faith fuel our worship? And let's live a life that can only be explained by the existence of a God that is so much greater than us. The earth is the Lord, Psalms 24 and 1. And the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. Psalms 89 and 11. The heavens are thine. The earth also is thine, and the world and the fullness of, uh, of thereof, thou founded them. 1 Corinthians 10 and 26, for the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. All of it belongs to God. And I'll deviate for a moment, but that's what mystifies me, why we think we're sacrificing when we give him an hour and a half on Sunday. Your time is the Lord's anyway. Your heart that beats is the Lord anyway. The dreams in your mind are the Lord's anyway. The money in the bank is the Lord's anyway. So has anyone ever really sacrificed anything for God when all you're doing is giving back what he loaned to you? Giving back what you've borrowed and you weren't worthy to possess anyway? You didn't get anything on your own. You didn't get it by your intelligence, by your own thought process, but God's given you every good thing you've ever enjoyed. So it ought to be a privilege to say, here I am, Lord. Here's my song. Here's my hands. Here's my worship. Here's my time. Here's my cash. Do whatever you want to do with me, God. Because every good and perfect gift comes down from you. I'm just a recipient of your mercy. You know, it is estimated that there are 100,000 quadrillion Vision trillion atoms in the observable in universe. So in case you missed that number, that's 10 to the 82nd power. That is 10 with 82 zeros behind it. And every single atom traces its origin back to four words. Let there be light. 
God created every atom. God controls every atom. God can heal them. God can start them. God can stop them. God can multiply them. God can curse them. God can free them. God can restore a withered hand. He can curse a fig tree. God made it. God controls it. And I'm here to tell someone you're never stranded. As long as God is in control, there is hope for every situation in this room. Physicists have quantified four fundamental forces that work in the earth. Gravitational, electromagnetic, strong nuclear, weak nuclear. Four forces that govern all of our lives. But quantum physicists postulate the existence of a mysterious fifth force. That mysterious fifth force governs all the other four forces. They call it the gluon particle. I agree. God is the gluon that binds subatomic particles together. They call it the God particle. God's word is the kinetic energy that animates every other molecule in the Milky Way. My word upholds creation. That's what he said. Yet every atom was affected by the fall of man. When Adam ate from the tree of knowledge, good, and evil, the law of entropy was introduced. That's the law of death. And into the equation of creation, decay began. Metal rusts. Food rots. Muscles atrophy. Cells mutate. Stars collapse. People die. But there is no atom in your body or in the universe that is not subject to God's overriding authority. Not the winds and the waves that beat against your boat. Oh, not the neurons in the right hemisphere of your brain that spark your faith. Not the antibodies in your bloodstream that fight off infection. Not the enzymes in your liver that de de detox and, de and digest. You hear me clearly. They're all under control of Almighty God. You are never stranded. Whether it's a physical affliction, emotional torment, whether you're in the between decisions and judgments, you hear this preacher, God is in control. Should I go on? Not the cells that have been dead and decomposing four days. They all have to obey the words of their divine creator. Every double helix is subject to intelligent design. And the one who made the genetic code can certainly alter the genetic code. Does anyone believe what I'm preaching? Genesis 8 and 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer, winter, day and night shall not cease. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. To everything there is a season and a time and a purpose under heaven. Daniel 2 and verse 20. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever and ever for wisdom and might are his and he changeth the times the seasons he removeth kings and setteth up kings he giveth wisdom to the wise and knowledge and understanding he reveals the deep and secret things he knoweth what is in darkness and what is in light God is not about to leave you stranded not as a church, not as worshipers, not as a family, not as a single. God is not about to leave you stuck on the side of the road uh, hoping for a way out uh, because God never moves in halfway measures. He is fully complete. He is the perfect example of all that he is. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding and abundantly uh, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Uh, ah yeah, being confident uh, of this very thing that he that begun a good work in you he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ I got glorious news for this church God's not finished and God will complete what he began in Gainesville
Watch this. Psalms 139 and 5. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? I just like that word, whither. Just sounds smart. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Where can I go? Where can I flee? Run as hard as you want to run. Let life manipulate your emotions. React to every changing circumstances in your life. But remember this, God doesn't react to circumstances. We want God to react, but God doesn't react. We want God to shout louder than the storm. We want God to be more active than the earthquake. We want to see Him in the fire, but God always whispers because God is close. God whispers to assure us that His nature cannot be escaped. If I Send into the heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. I love the next part. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the earth, even there. Say those two words. Say, even there. Touch your neighbor. Say, even there. Shall his hand lead thee. Say it. Tell him. Shall his hand lead thee. Say, even there. Watch this, watch this. If I say, surely the darkness is covering me. I'm engulfed with no way out. Even the night is light because you're the Lord of the day and the Lord of the night. Because, I like it because then the psalmist explains it. Watch this. Next verse, watch. The darkness doesn't hide from you, but the night shineth as a day. For the darkness and the light are alike to thee. I'm glad I serve a God like that. Oh, I thought you'd appreciate a little bit more of his divine nature. I'm glad I serve a God like that. So we've established a reality that God is perfectly pure, oneness, that he's the best attribute of whatever attribute describes him. That's what he is. We've also established that there's days and nights and seasons and winters and springs and falls and changing of times and changing of seasons, but yet God is the same. There are cycles within the spiritual realm just as they are in the natural. Cycles of blessings, seasons of pain. But anytime you're going to alter your destiny, you have to break a cycle. If you're in a cycle, I'll explain it to you. If you're in a cycle of blessing, the season of anointing, the enemy wants to tempt you to sin. Because the enemy can't stop a season of blessing in your life. The enemy can't impede the natural seasons that God puts in process in the natural world. Nor can any spirit impede the spiritual cycles of blessing and anointing. The enemy can't stop what God's got planned for you. Psalms 1, one of my favorite verses, scripture text and all of the scripture. If you go 1, 2, and 3, I don't have time to preach it. I'm already at 30 minutes. But watch this. Psalms 1 and verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, nor standeth in the way of the sinner. So watch. He's walking, but he hears ungodly counsel. And it stops his forward momentum. And then he stands around with people he normally wouldn't stand around with and starts talking things he would normally never agree with. And the next thing you know, he's sitting in criticism and cynicism. Because ungodly counsel will stop your forward progress. Now let me tell you something. All counsel... All ungodly counsel is not from ungodly people. I know people who profess to be Christians who give terrible counsel. I know people who have the spirit who give ungodly counsel. They don't counsel us to seek first the kingdom. They don't counsel us uh, to give it all to God uh, and forsake all and commit all. No, they give us ungodly counsel. So just because someone sits on the pew by you doesn't mean it's godly counsel. You say, then how do I know if it's godly counsel? Right here. If it agrees with the book, it's good counsel. So watch this. So a, a cursed man hears wrong words and a cursed man loses his momentum and stands in the wrong place and a cursed man finally sits in scorn about the things of God but a blessed man verse 2 a blessed man counsels himself from the word of God 
A blessed man reads the word of God and in the law doth he meditate day and night. If we quote it, watch. Watch this. A blessed man takes his freedom. He takes his worship out of the reality. Psalms 1 and 2. Put it on the board. I want him to see it. Psalms 1 and 2. Watch this. So the first verse says what? Quote it. I just quoted it to you. Blessed is the man that does what? That walks not in the cause of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the But his delight, watch this, verse 2, you ready? Watch it. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That word law means structure there in the Hebrew. That's not the Bible yet. That means structure. That doesn't mean the Bible. The next law, look, and in that law, that word there means the Bible, the promises. But the first law means the reality. It means I take my confidence in the idea God doesn't change. He's perfectly pure. He's always reliable. He's always faithful. The night and the day are the same to Him. I take my delight in the structure and identity of who I serve. So that's why it's imperative you know the first and greatest commandment that God is one. Because when you stand on that reality that God God is whatever he is in the perfect way possible. Then I know that's why God couldn't tell Moses what he was, but yet he said, I am that I am. The whatever I need to express, I express it perfectly. That's why he couldn't lock himself in to just deliverance or just redemption. He had to say, I am what I am, because he couldn't limit himself by his own description, because his words are the laws that uphold everything. So in the law of who God is, I delight. And in what I I believe about God I find strength and then in the promises of God I take heart and I speak to myself put it back on the board one and two right but his delights in the law of the Lord and in that law in the words of the Lord do I meditate meditate is the Hebrew word hagar it means to talk to yourself that's what it means it means, it means to speak to yourself. And we're terrified of meditation in our day. We think about the lotus position in the third eye and a bright light coming down. That's not it. Meditation predates yoga. Hear me real clearly. He said, I'm sitting down and I'm telling myself, you're above and not beneath. You're ahead and not the tail. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm speaking to myself promises and I'm delighting in the reality of who God is. Now watch verse 3. Put verse 3 up, Psalms 1-3. Watch this. And he should be like a tree planted. You're not haphazardly thrown. You don't go to Home Depot and buy a plant and throw it out in the dirt and say, I hope it grows. You look at where it needs sun. Does it need partial shade? Does it need full sun? Does it need the pH balanced? What does it need? And you should be like a tree. If you take your delight in the reality of God and you counsel yourself from the word, he said, I'm going to plant you right where I want you with provision around you, with sustenance around you, with propriety around you. Look at this. And you will bring forth fruit in your season. That's why I don't panic when you're blessed because I know my turn's coming because I've been canceling myself in the word of God. That's why I don't despise another man's blessing or despise another man's season because I realize how my day's coming, my turn. But let me tell you something. Envy exists. Envy takes its root. It exists in the hearts of people who think their best days are over. Envy lives in the hearts of people who think their best days have come and gone. Envy lives in people that think I can't have what you have because God isn't faithful to me. God, I can't get what you got because I'm not smart enough or good enough. We don't get it because we're smart or we're good. We get it because God is faithful. So anyone ever been in a season? I've been in a season like that. I'll be honest, I'm in a season like that right now. And I am terrified. I get the anointed monogram towel. Woo. I'm about to preach now. I've been in a cycle like that. And I am terrified to take one misstep. I walk in confidence and faith, but I'm prayerful and I'm careful because I'm not going to let the favor of God lift off of my life. And that's what the enemy wants to do. 
Anytime you get in a cycle of anointing, he brings distraction and frustration and pain. He don't care about your hot water tank. He just wants you to have a bad attitude. He don't care about your leaky roof or your broken down car. He just wants you to fuss at your wife and violate the principles of God's word in anger and attack. He just wants you to fall into pornography and lust. Not because he gives a hoot. Do you understand? The ultimate prize is the eternal soul. The ultimate prize is the eternal soul. And God, hear me clearly, uses the spirit to get to the soul. The enemy uses the flesh to get to the soul. That's why Paul said, we crucify the flesh and we keep it under subjection. Because the enemy's using my flesh to get to my soul. The ultimate prize is the eternal soul that never dies. And I got news for hell, you can't have mine. So the enemy will do anything he can do to get you to flinch. He spent 40 years enduring the consequences of other people's ignorant decisions. And it should have been enough to derail anybody's faith. Yet Joshua never stumbled. He never gave in. He never lost sight of God's promise. And when Moses has died, God chose Joshua to be his successor. Hear me. Before Joshua... God's people were migrants and they were living hand to mouth. After Joshua, hear me, they were settlers and owners of the exceeding good land God promised. Before Joshua, they're migrants living in tents. After Joshua, they're owners. The story God has scripted for your life, it isn't inferior to Joshua's. There is an exceeding good land an exceeding good blessing that God has stored up for you and you're meant to occupy it. So watch what happens with Joshua. And the Lord said to Joshua in Joshua 10 and 8, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into mine hand. There should not be a man that stands before thee. Did you hear it? Watch this. You're going to like it. Joshua has the audacity to ask God to stop the sun in the sky. Did you hear the promise in Joshua 10 and 8? No man will stand before thee. So Joshua marches all night long to get in position. And Joshua has the audacity to say, God, stop the sun so I can finish your promise. Freeze time on the behalf of the people. I remember you said it. None shall stand before thee. Most of us would have been content with what God accomplished in the daytime. And when the Amorites are hanging on to the cover of darkness, rejoicing that the sun was about to set, night never came. Just when they thought the curtains were going to fall on their day from hell, the curtains never fell. God stepped out and said, how about an encore, Joshua? I'm stopping the sun. I'm holding the moon. And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky so God's people could take their promises. The skeptic in me, I'll just tell you, the skeptic in me, I want to know, did God stop the earth on its axis? Did God stop the sun in its orbit? Did God create some type of pseudo light to just shine down on the earth so that God is light after all? My faith's pretty simple. And I don't know all the answers to every one of those questions, but here's what I know. I choose to believe the same God who created the cosmos and orders and governs all. He stepped in on the behalf of his people some majestic supernatural way. And he chose to answer an outrageous prayer and he did what only God could do. So I'm challenging someone in this house. Some of you are frustrated right now because the cycle you're in isn't a cycle of blessing and anointing. It's a cycle of frustration and fear. But anytime, I said it earlier, you're going to alter your destiny. You have to break a cycle. And I believe in this house you could hurry to this altar and say, God, finish what you started. Stop the sun. Suspend the fear. Stop the pain. Hinder the attack. Change the circumstance. And I'm convinced today that we don't miss the cycle because we're going to ask in faith, audacious, 
crazy. Out of the edge of normal prayers, God, save every one of my family members. Fill every one of my children with your spirit. Heal my marriage. Multiply my money. Stand to your feet all over this house. Some of you have already figured it out. I'm not giving an invitation. If you just want to ask God something big, hurry. If you need a breakthrough in your marriage, hurry because it's time to ask. If you need a deliverance in your finances, hurry, come on. If you need a healing in your body, it's time to ask. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Spirit, come on. Hallelujah. I stand before you invincible, unequaled, none like me. If you can believe there is no good thing I would withhold from you. I am in control and I stand august and supreme alone, your God. But not only am I powerful, filling all space, I chose to place myself in the confines of a mortal body and walk amongst you. There is not a pain, there is not a fear that you face that I have not already faced. And I overcame them, for Satan had nothing within me. Today, ask me, and I will fight for you. The sun will stop. The miracles will come. Can you believe the words I have delivered? You ought to raise your hands and love God all over this house. You ought to raise your hands and let God begin to move right now. Surely you can do better than that. The Lord's speaking to us through his words and through his gifts today. Open yourself to his presence right now. Something's shifting. There's a new season coming. I'm, I'm breaking a cycle. Something's shifting. Hallelujah. Woo. Come on, that's it. That's it. I believe God. Now go ahead and tell him, I'm going to do what I know I can do. I'm going to do what only I can do, so you'll do what only you can do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Would you send up a thanks to the Lord all over this room? Praise God. Wow. There was so much covered today. It fried my brain. We need to, you can't catch all that. The, the Lord has just gifted this precious man with being able to expound the word of God and help us. And think about what he said. If we believe that God is perfect in everything he does and is, what would be hard to trust him? He could not, he's not a politician. He's never going to lie to us. He's not a scam artist. He loves us, cares about us. That's what the cross is all about. Amen. Amen. And, and people who've made a mistake can go back and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. You won't ever find them standing against you. That's impossible. Thank you so much for coming this morning. One service only. We've already prayed over the food and blessed it. All of our folks, I think you said 75 and older, head towards the prayer room and get, go this way. Go this way through the prayer room. Get our seniors seated in the back and we got plenty of food to feed everybody greet some folks and shake hands and be friendly thank you for coming thank you for coming hallelujah thank you for coming there's no god like jehovah